after I made my comments this morning, and you were reverencing the sacred cross, and I was consuming what was left of the Holy Eucharist, the thought drifted across my mind whether or not there'd be one or two people in this parish, certainly no more than that, who might not have grasped completely what I was talking about this morning when I spoke of the Pope's remarks in Regensburg this past week. Did everybody grasp what I was saying? I see a bunch of people nodding their head, yes. Michelle, Mark, uh, Michael, they're all saying their head. I heard a, a faint no from the side. Big no from the side. But you, Julie? A voluntarism. I suspect that that might be the case. I seem, I seem to have uncovered the two people in the parish who missed it. Uh, if you need to really know voluntarism in detail, I refer you to Jeremy because I think he has done research in this area when he was at Moody. Or well, maybe not. Voluntarism comes from the Latin word voluntas, meaning the will. Volo. Now, to give you, to give you uh, an introduction to this, I felt so sorry for the Holy Father this past week. I saw that on uh, TV, I saw, I think it was Fox, which actually showed him giving the talk, and he was speaking very softly and gently in German, and they had a little thing underneath. It was, the, the man is a theology professor. He simply said in public things, the sort of things that he said back when he was a professor at Regensburg. Uh, he has the mode of a theology professor. He is, he's essentially a, a, a seminarian professor. That's, that's what he does. I mean, that's, what he, that's, what, that's the way he was trained and all. I could see myself saying all these things. What he said the other day, if I were speaking about that here in this parish, I would attack voluntarism like half of you were, were voluntarists, and I'd have come after you with, with, with fire and sword. You must give it up, brethren, you know, this sort of thing. Give up this voluntarism. But he was saying it very sweetly as a sweet personality, saying it very sweetly and so forth. And then by way of illustration, toward the tail end, he gives this, this quotation from Michael II Piliotagus. Uh, with reference to Islam, which is, a, is exactly the sort of illustration I would give if I were lecturing on this subject in a class. But of course, CNN is right there in his face, and, and uh, New York Times, which, which came out yesterday, Lee Pottles showed me this in the airport yesterday, the New York Times yesterday on the front page insisted that he apologize immediately to, to Islam. The Times of London is the only journal I've found so far that had the foggiest idea of what was going on. Now, there would be some others. But the Times of London went right to the heart of the thing. He has, he's not saying anything about Islam. He's talking about Western rationalism and the, and, the, and the divorce of reason from supra-rational and sub-rational perceptions of truth. Let's come back to voluntarism. Um, I have written on this in an illustrious journal uh, several times. Let me ask you this question. It was a hot question in the, along the scholastics of the 13th through the 14th centuries. Not, I think, much earlier, although the question itself is posed by, by Boethius. In fact, in, 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 in German, it's even posed by Socrates. When God tells me, thou shalt not kill, 
Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. It means that's wrong, right? Now, the question is, is it wrong because God forbids me to do it? Or does he forbid me to do it because it's wrong? Let me give you a parallel example. There's a sign, I'm going down the street, there's a sign saying, one way. Okay. Now, is it wrong to turn right on that street, and therefore it's forbidden by law, or is it wrong because it's forbidden by law? Take a one-way street, any one-way street in Chicago. The city, the city ordinance of Chicago says you will not, you you must go northwest on this street. You may not go south, southeast. Yes, please. Father, is that another way of saying, or, or would it be another way of, to say the same thing? Um, to ask the question is, well, is it wrong because it's forbidden by law, or is it wrong because it's forbidden That's another way of saying it, but you're much more abstract than me. <laughs> but it's essentially the same thing. Okay. There's all kinds of ways of posing that question. I'll give you a couple of others. When the city says you must go southeast on this street and you may not go northwest. So if you go the opposite direction, it's clearly wrong. Now is it wrong because the city forbade it or did the city forbid it because it's wrong? I think it's pretty obvious to everybody here, we don't, we don't expect such metaphysical perceptions of the city council of Chicago. In other words, it's only wrong because it's forbidden. There's nothing particularly intrinsically wrong with doing it. It's wrong because it's forbidden. On that physical level, we have to do the opposite of everything the city I see some of you are distracted. <laughs> okay. You, 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 follow, you follow that. In law like this, there's a certain amount of voluntarism. And we expect that. The state of Illinois says, thou shalt do no murder. It's on the books. You cannot take the life of an innocent person. You can be prosecuted for it. Let me pose the same question for you. Is it wrong because the state of Illinois says it's wrong? Or does the state of Illinois say it's wrong because it's wrong? You see, there's a difference there, isn't it? You are crediting the state of Illinois with a perception of truth, and then it's basing its law on the truth. In this particular case, and in whole lots of cases, the law is not just the expression of will, voluntarism, it's the expression of intellect and will as the servant of intellect. The state of Illinois says, having examined the question carefully, we have decided that murder is intrinsically wrong, and therefore we have a book, a law on the books that says you may not do it. See, that's not voluntarism. In that particular case, it's not the will of the state that supports the law, it's the perception of truth that supports the law. You see the difference? In the second case, the law is rational. And in obeying the law, we are obeying reason. When I obey the law that tells me to which way to drive, or when to stop at a red light, because they could turn it around and say, you have to stop at green lights and go on red. It's quite arbitrary. It's not intrinsic to the nature of the thing. Now the question is, are there any laws, any laws at all, which are not simply the expression of will, but the expression of intellect? 
prior to recently, every state in the United States had laws against abortion. Now the court decides that these are unconstitutional and so these laws are gone. So now it is permissible, within certain limits, to kill the unborn child. Now, back when that was wrong, was it wrong because the state said so, or did the state say so because it was wrong? In other words, was the root of the will simply the expression, pardon me, the root of the law, simply the expression of, of will, or was it the expression of intellect? Was there rational content to the law? Because if that's true, then certain laws may not be changed because truth does not change. With me on that? The question is, is whether law, eternal law, specifically God's law, whether that is simply the expression of God's will or the expression of his intellect and his will at the service of his intellect. Now, in the Middle Ages, philosophers who thought about serious problems back in those days, they did not, by the way, think about how many angels could fit on, on, the, on the point of a, of a, of a pin. I, I, don't, I don't recall that argument anywhere. That's just, that's just that's a myth. Uh, since angels have no spatial, they have, they have locus but not cetus. I say they have a place but they don't have extension. Then it seems to me you could put any number of angels on the point of the pin. Well, they do want to put a number on Yeah. No, I don't want to put a number on but the number of angels is not infinite because there's no such thing as an infinite number. They also put, they examine that question too. But they examined serious questions in those days. Now let's come back to the question. The scholastic theologians, let me remark in passing that this, this recent, recent bias against scholasticism in the Eastern Church is just malarkey. Uh, scholasticism began in the Eastern Church. There were the, the great scholastic theologians like St. John of Damascus and uh, the, uh, the uh, Zygabanus at, at Constantinople, all of them are earlier than, uh, clearly, clearly John of Damascus is earlier than Anselm. And even when Anselm wrote, there were no universities in the West. I mean, he's prior to all the universities. But the, but the scholasticism, the scholastic, scholastic tradition of the church, the universal church, because it's as much East as it is West, and, and scholasticism flowered in the East until the rise of, of, the, of the Turk destroyed our schools. Uh, which still, but, but since World War I, about World War I, and this, especially people like Vladimir Lasky, scholasticism has become a very bad word among Eastern Orthodox, and I, I really decry that, that this, this anti-scholasticism. It usually means is, we Orthodox don't think clearly, we have very blurry thoughts. <laughs> uh, well, anybody, what we mean, what, what that usually means is, I've read Maximus the Confessor and I can't understand him. Well, that's different. <laughs> to think that Maximus the Confessor thought blurry thoughts, you just haven't read <laughs> Maximus the Confessor, you know. Uh, the work is called The Ambigua because we find it hard to understand, <laughs> not because it's ambiguous. <laughs> anyway, come back to the, the, the scholastic debate that took place between Oxford and Paris at the end of the 13th and the beginning of the 14th century. The major light in Oxford was a man by the name of Duns Scotus. The major light in Paris, somewhat earlier, is a man by the name of Thomas Aquinas. Both of them very, very clear thinkers, sort of waiting for a German like, like Joseph Ratzinger to, to, to compare them. Although I can name an Irishman who's been comparing them for years. <laughs> Polycarp. Yes, I do. Yeah. Uh, it, it, I have a picture of Cardinal Rotzinger back when he was a, a cardinal, and underneath it says the Cardinal uh, Cardinal Rotzinger fan club. <laughs> there is such a thing, and I really do belong to it. <laughs> Putting the smack down on heresy since 19, 1981. <laughs> you have that too. Putting the smack down on heresy since 1981. 
That, that's, that's, a co that's a coffee uh, mug that I drink from. The day he was elected pope, I immediately ordered the big beer mug that has the same thing. <laughs> Thomas Aquinas said, when God says, thou shalt do no murder, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, God forbids those things because they're wrong. In other words, there's a cause and effect operation. Therefore, the law itself is understandable. It has an intrinsic intelligibility. Aristotle says that understanding is the perception of the relationship between cause and effect. To understand something is to know it in its causes. And then he goes on to distinguish four different ways which you do that, which are the four causes of Aristotle. But the perception of cause and effect, the understanding of things in their causes, is that is understanding. So when I read these commandments, I don't just have a law in front of me. I have an entire system of truth about marriage, about human life, about property, about speech. In other words, the law itself expresses intelligible truth. It is not simply the expression of a blind will. Along comes, yes, go ahead. You're probably better at this anyway. No, but what, what troubles me about this whole issue, and like, this is anomalous and I have trouble with this Christmas issue, um, that from the human perspective, does that not make truth, uh, law, reality, true truth, an antecedent of God? Are we, isn't that a false dichotomy if we say God's influence is somehow separate from... I'm coming to that, darling. I'm really coming to that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I, that's why I'm coming to Duns Scotus. Because that's the objection. Precisely, word for word, the objection of Duns Scotus. Duns Scotus comes along. I didn't understand your question. Well, uh, you, you will now. You will now. Okay. Along comes Duns Scotus, he reads Thomas Aquinas, he says, no. He says, if you say God knows these things to be so, and therefore makes his law in this way, then God is no longer sovereign. God is determined by a truth outside himself. It would be impossible for God to say, murder is okay, adultery is okay, stealing is okay, uh, perjury is okay be because God couldn't do that. You'd be tying God's hands. His hands would be tied by truth. God would be obliged to make these laws the way he makes them. Therefore, God is not sovereign. But God must be sovereign because he's God. Therefore, God could very well have said, thou shalt commit murder, thou shalt commit adultery, thou shalt steal, Thou shalt bear false witness. In other words, he slips God's will above God's intellect. That is voluntarism. That is voluntarism. As soon as God's will is above his intellect, you've got voluntarism. Because truth now simply becomes the knowledge of what God has arbitrarily decided. Now, Elaine is, Elaine is correct. This is simply man's way of going about it. We don't have any idea how this works in God. We, we believe God to be simple, and therefore these, even the notion of faculties in God, undivided, undivided the notion of these faculties in God. It's a question, it, the question has to do, though, with whether the structure of the universe is intelligible. That's the question. It appeared to me many years ago when I first read this and saw it and understood. I took this all in philosophy when I was in college, but I didn't understand any of it, none of it. I did, this was all, I memorized a bunch of stuff, you know, understandings, the knowledge of things and their causes. I, when I started teaching philosophy years later, I thought, wait a minute. This, 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 there, there's something here to be understood. John. Is that principle uh, what is behind Calvinism? Absolutely, absolutely. If the divine will is the root of all things and not truth, then the universe as such is not necessarily intelligible. Therefore, when I speak of goodness, B, 
beauty, even truth. These are simply constructs in my mind. These are names that I apply to a whole bunch of things, like the word soft, soft water, soft bed, soft sounds. Those are only analogies, aren't they? We're using the word soft differently. So I would say good wine, good bread, good people, good weather. I'm using the word analogously. Therefore, says the man who sat at the foot of Duns Scotus, William of Ockham, who sat at the foot of Duns Scotus, says, there are these abstractions are simply things we create in our mind, and these are just names, nomina. When I know them, I'm not knowing anything that actually exists outside my mind. These are composites that I'm putting together in my mind. I'm not describing the universe as it is. I'm describing the universe as I construct it in my mind. That's a way of saying that the universe as such is not intelligible. Let me give you another example. This one's from Aristotle. In fact, I used to ask this question of my students the uh, first day of, when I teach philosophy class, the first day of class, I ask this question of my students. Does the bird fly because it has wings? Or does it have wings in order to fly? And usually I get some dumb remark, well, well penguins don't fly. I mean, I, 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 <laughs> which doesn't really help the advance the call <laughs> at all. Or I'd get the usual thing. Well, they developed these wings in order to fly so they could escape from, from the prey, from, from the, those who, who, who were preying on them. So they, they gradually developed these wings. So the first bird apparently said, you know, if I can sort of work out there a little bit, <laughs> about three billion years from now, my ancestors will be able to go like this. Uh, I mean, that's Darwinism. No, Darwinism is, Darwin is even less than that. The bird didn't have to think anything. It just happened this way. The birds that developed wings, they, they got away, and so they survived. The birds that didn't develop wings, they got eaten, so they disappeared. Or we call them apes, or whatever. You know. <laughs> uh, they learned to fly, they learned to climb trees and get away from the lion, or whatever. Now, come back to the question. Does the bird fly because it has wings, or does it have wings in order to fly? Contemporary... Natural history says the bird flies because it has wings. It just worked out that way. One day the bird found himself with these wings, and he's figuring out, what in the heck can I do with them? They're there. They've evolved. I met it. My, my, my predecessors have all survived, and they've left me with these wings. Now, what am I going to do with them? Well, he tries to rotate his tires. It doesn't work very well. <laughs> he tries to work on his computer. It's not good. You know, there's just, the feathers get in the way. It just doesn't work. But he finds, dang, I can fly. So he flies. In other words, there's no intrinsic relationship between the wing and the flight of the bird. Are you with me here? There's no cause-effect relationship between the wing and the flight of the bird. There's no design in it. It is like propping open a window with a screwdriver. It just happens to work. But the screwdriver wasn't designed to prop open windows, but it does happen to work. But there's no intelligible relationship between the screwdriver or the wrench or whatever I'm using to block open the window. If you hear any heresy, uh, Augustine, I'm counting on you to come forward. <laughs> Elaine's watching me like a hawk. <laughs> okay. Yes, sir. Great impact on the inerrancy of scripture. Where it all winds up. Yes, it does. It does. But you're about even the people who held these other views, though, for a long time they held they held the inerrancy of scripture. That that that's a that's a modern uh, a modern uh, aberration. They, they, they speak about error uh, in, in, in the Bible. Um, I was not going to bring up Calvin, but I'll bring up Calvin. 
because uh, John spotted it right away. Am I sent to heaven or hell because God foreknows what I'm going to do and then predestines me to heaven and hell? Thomas Aquinas says, I'm predestined, I'm predestined on the basis of God's foreknowledge of what I'm going to do. Calvin says, no, because if I'm predestined on the basis of what I'm going to do, then I'm determining God's decision. And therefore, God is not sovereign. Therefore, to, pres to preserve the sovereignty of God, God must decide this ahead of time and predestine each person to heaven or hell. That's, that's the P in the tulip. And that's distinctively Calvinist. There's a little bit of that in some of the other formers, but that, that is so distinctively Calvinist. Um, Augustine, had, Augustine did not reason that way, but Augustine himself did have a double predestination. Uh, I, I've read Augustine very carefully on this. I do not see a pre-knowledge predestination in, uh, in, in, in uh, Augustine, but it's very, there in, very much there in Calvin. Now, Duns Scotus, although he himself never drew these conclusions, taught people who did draw these conclusions, such as William of Ockham. And William of Ockham is, is he's called the father of nominalism, though he's by no means the father of nominalism. Nominalism was here before, as I, when I gave my... Uh, I gave my, my paper at the Touchstone Conference several years ago, Divisions We Must Sustain. I just took William de la Porre as, as my nominalist. And I'm not sure he's in the first one, but he's the first one to get done by the church for it, as far as I know. Uh, and who was, the, who was the person who went after William de la Porre and Selma of Canterbury? The massive realist. The one who says, yes, and we know eternal truth. We really do know it. We know, it's not just a, a, a thing we have in our minds. Now, if the Pope had stopped at that point, everybody would have walked out of the, uh, ex except, you know, the smart people like the people here, would have walked out of the wonderful cathedral at Regensburg, a magnificent, one of my favorite cathedrals in the whole world, that, the, those two statues there at the top of the nave of Mary up on top of the pillar over here and the angel over there. He's declaring him, this angel's got this magnificent seraphic smile, and that smiling angel, I guess, is one of the most famous statues in, in, uh, in Germany. They would have walked out and thought, Pope sure socked it to the nominalists. <laughs> but you see, nominalism is, is, is at, the, at the foundation of all modern aberrations of this sort. The separation of truth from the structure of the world. Um, I refer you to a wonderful book in this respect. Be prepared, perhaps, to read it twice, but I do recommend it uh, sincerely. It's by Richard Weaver, called Ideas Have Consequences. Ideas Have Consequences. And he traces, he doesn't go back to, nom he doesn't go back to voluntarism. He only goes back to, to nominalism. I wish, sort of wish, but you can't keep tracing everything back and back. He starts with nominalism, specifically the nominalists of, of England in the 14th century, and traces the development of that thought till we get to modern thought and evolution. There would, could not have been someone like Darwin, could not have been someone like that, without the, the philosophical underpinnings of a, of a, of a long system, of a, a, a long history of thought. Now, toward the end of his talk, the Holy Father said that this was a problem also with Islam. And of course it is. Islam has a completely apophatic God. He is absolutely sovereign. His will determines all things. When it comes to predestination, the Calvinist is a bit of a piker beside the, beside, beside the, beside the, uh, beside the, the Muslim. The Muslim is absolutely predestination. Everything depends on the eternal will of God. And since we, who are not believers, in the Muslim sense, unbelievers, since we don't adhere to this religion, we must be the most reprobate of all. And since we're going to hell anyway, it doesn't make any difference what they do to us. The, the most that would ever be required of them, should never to respect us, 
but simply to tolerate us. That's the most they would do is simply to tolerate us because we're all doomed to hell anyway. God does not love us. He loves the, he loves, he loves the Muslim, but he does not love the Christian. But we will, we will what's the name of the book, Dimitude? That, that new book out? Dimitude? The, 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 the lot. What is the lot of a Christian in a Muslim society? Well, somehow or other, we've got folks asking us to believe that in places like Egypt and Syria and, and places over and in Iraq, the Christians are on the same level with Muslims. That is a myth, absolute myth. Um, but the Muslim, the Pope was saying, the Muslim really does not have an intelligible universe. He has a universe that's only the expression of God's will, and therefore it cannot be studied with, as a means of arriving at the knowledge of God, which scripture says, we're supposed to do. We're supposed to study the things that he made in order to have some understanding of him. His eternal power and his wisdom, all these things are listed in, in uh, Romans 1 or in uh, the Wisdom of Solomon chapter 13. Any questions? Yes, yes Phil. Did any uh, Shia Muslims object to the Pope's remarks, not on the ground that they were anti because they're saying, hey, wait a minute, we're not voluntarists. <laughs> Phil, that's a very good question. I would have to look and see. The, the riots that I saw on TV and read about the newspapers uh, were mainly in Egypt. Oh, that was a pretty small demonstration in Egypt. It was covered by, by, the, by the networks, but it was a fairly small demonstration. I think only 100 people. But the, the big ones were in, the big ones were in uh, Gaza and in Lebanon. Uh, in, pa in Pakistan, they had, in fact, the Pakistani parliament met and had a resolution to condemn the Pope. I had to figure out what the... You think the city council's bad? <laughs> uh, there may be something like that with respect to Turkey because the Pope is supposed to be going to Turkey uh, very soon. And uh, I just wonder if he's going to be physically safe over a place like Turkey. Jeremy? Well, what is his illustration? It was a dialogue, a 14th century dialogue, shortly before the downfall of Constantinople, between Michael II Paleologus, the Roman emperor, they keep calling him the Byzantine emperor, they never called themselves Byzantine, they called themselves Romans, the Roman emperor at Byzantium, called uh, Michael II Paleologus, and a Persian philosophy, philosopher. And they're dialoguing about the contributions of, his, of Islam and Christianity to the culture of the world. And Michael II Polyologus, of course, the Persian is talking about the wonderful contributions that Islam has made to the world. Polyologus is going the opposite. You didn't make any wonderful contributions at all. Everything good you ever did, you got from the Greeks, which is true. Aristotle, for example, Plato. Everything, you ever, everything good you ever had, you got from the Greeks. In fact, what did you ever bring except fire and the sword and rapine? That's all you, that's all you ever brought. The Pope, the Pope cited this and he said this is, uh, he says it's sort of startling, startlingly direct or something like brusque. that. Brusque. Brusque. Start, startlingly brusque. But, he, okay. but what he did not say, he didn't condemn it. He didn't condemn it. He didn't, he didn't define it, he just said brusque. The startlingly brusque. brusque. Yeah. yeah, a whole bunch of us think the Pope was spot on. <laughs> and this needed to be said a long time earlier. Uh, because he, he was talking about nominalism and whether you have an intelligible or unintelligible universe. And he says, this came to a head in this dialogue between the Persian and, 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 and the Greek, the, the, the Byzantine emperor. Uh, the one had an intelligible universe and the other didn't. And the Persians saying, we've contributed many, we Muslims contributed many great things to civilization. And the Greek is saying, no, you didn't. Everything good you ever did, you got from us Greeks. All you ever really brought on the world was a bunch of trouble. That's the part he quoted. Uh, because he's a professor. Professors do that. I have said things like that much stronger than that. Right here, I think I've said things. <laughs> but certainly back when I taught in, taught in philosophy class, I said much stronger things than that. 
for the students writing it down dutifully because they're going to have to answer it back when they get the exam. But once in a great while, I would have students protest, particularly comments made on abortion, on the Equal, equal Rights Amendment, <laughs> and some other things of which I expressed <clears throat> strong views. <laughs> and and, I, and I, had, I, had, uh, I had people going to the, the dean to complain about me, bringing charges against me, and things of this sort. I can tell you one instance where I was, I was lecturing on, on, the, on the books of Samuel, and I was t had a section of the course, was three or four weeks, was on the women in the books of Samuel. In the course of it, apropos of I don't know what, I cited Mary Wollstonecraft. You know who Mary Wollstonecraft was? Who wrote the treatise on the liberation of women. I cited her favorably. Mary Wollstonecraft was the, uh, was the uh, mother of Mary Shelley, uh, the, the, the one who wrote the, 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 the famous story, Frankenstein. Um, anyway, I, I cited Mary Wollstonecraft th to this effect. Mary Wollstonecraft says that if a civilization does not, is not sufficiently advanced economically, <clears throat> that it can afford to give equal education to men and to women, reason dictates they should give the better education to the women because they're the ones who educate the children. I, I like that idea. That idea is rational, coherent. If you can't afford to educate everybody, at least educate the women because they're the ones who teach little children. So you want them better educated. That's what the Aga Khan said. I didn't know that. But anyway, I said that in class. Sure enough, sure enough, a female student went off to the dean, filed Clark charges that I had said women should not be educated unless you're going to have kids. <laughs> she not only went to the dean about that, she went to the local newspaper. So this was on the front page. This is the front page of the, of the Ambridge newspaper. Uh, of course, I had about five other women in the class, and they all, every one of them filed in to defend me that I didn't say what she said. And we did, in fact, have tapes of the class and things of this sort. So I was not fired and, and humiliated and exiled. Um, but, but I know what the Pope's up against. You get, people get their... Now, that was just a little thing I said in a class of maybe 50 people. He's being televised internationally <laughs> in millions of Muslims. <laughs> I, know, I don't think they watched it. I don't think they watched the speech at all. I think they would have been, would have been quite shocked if they had gotten past Dun Scotus. If they... Yes, sir? There was a short program yesterday on LBC where we broadcast the And the discussion was that the Turks who objected to the Pope's comment totally even missed the idea of voluntarism. They didn't even get there. They were objecting simply Really? <laughs> and, that, and that would, uh, of course, pollute uh, uh, all the prospects for them being accepted in the Euro uh, European Union. Which the Pope opposes, by the way. The Pope does oppose their interest in the European Union, unlike the Patriarch of Constantinople, who favors it. But the Patriarch of Constantinople sits under the, the thumb of the Sultan, so to speak. Yeah. Eva? Father, what was the Pope's apology? He didn't apologize. No, no, he, no, he, 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 you know, he said what he says, I regret, I regret, I regret. That's well short of an apology. Uh, however, I don't, the way the popes have been lately, 500 years from now, his successor will apologize. I mean, the, the Pope John Paul II apologized for everything back to St. Peter. I mean, he was, every, seemed like the weekly apology. He was coming out and apologizing to the, to the Byzantines for 10, 1204, Apologize to the Lutherans for 1517. I mean, he's apologizing to everybody. I was just sick, sick up to here with all his apologies. Get over it, for heaven's sakes. Let, you know, we're not all that sick. We all demand an apology. Uh, I think a bell rang, though, and I better let you out before those children come in because I wouldn't want them to hear what I said about volunteerism. <laughs> Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Now and ever and unto ages of ages. Amen. I don't see a lion. I don't see it. Did a lion bite you? Did a lion bite you? Did an elephant step on you?